Hello, hello, and welcome. Happy Friday. Welcome to the voice of American Africans United, and that's AAU. And you know, I haven't really said what AAU means in some time, so I'm going to remind everyone out there what American Africans United means. And so, and we have a good discussion today that really is going to bring us all hopefully full circle. But American Africans United is a national nonprofit that was organized and established here in Maryland in the United States. Our vision is to advance the truth of people of African descent as one and that we are one from common connected ancestry. Now our mission is to unite our local resources and develop communities that are strong spiritually, economically, politically, and socially, not only here in the United States, but around the world. So we are about building bridges. So we're excited here to be here every Friday with you, or actually every other Friday now, because it's coming now to the nice warm season. And so I want to thank all my audience out there who are with us today. And I am your host, Dr. Yvette Butler-Yaboa, and we have a great co-host today. And you'll, you, you might remember Dr. Paul Dyer, who is also the host of You Be the Judge. So he'll be with us as well. So he'll tell you a little bit about himself. And then we're going to talk about a great topic today. But let me tell, let me have my co-host introduce himself quickly, because I won't read his bio because it's it's amazing. But Dr. Dyer, thank you and welcome for being here today. And I hope you become a regular with me because um, I think we really work well together. So Dr. Dyer, tell us a little about yourself before we go into our dialogue for today. Well, um, just a little bit about myself. Well, I have four PhDs and a lot of it has a lot to do with neuroscience, um, human development and the human condition and naturopathic medicine. So that with physics and biochemistry. So with that is understanding how the chemistry affects the body with how you think and how you feel about different things. That's why I really teach emotional reaction training. It's about understanding about who you are, how you develop, and how you overcome and understand yourself. That's the short one. Ex-military also, that's Army, go Army. So um, I have a lot of life experiences that way. I have nine children, I have a beautiful wife. I have nine grandchildren and more in the way. But ultimately, this is about development. This is about understanding about who we are and how we can be a better people. Now, I didn't know you had nine children. Okay, wow. I said, that is great. I, I, I wish I could have had more. And I think I tell people I have a thousand children, children now because... You see my, I said, I'm wearing my insignia of Gap Buster. So we've serviced over 20,000 young people around the globe. And so I call them all my kids now. So I have thousands of children. But today, as many of you know, we always start our, start our programs off with a little background of what we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about internal internalized racism, which is something mm -hmm. that really a lot of us don't understand. And we definitely don't talk about it. And with Dr. Dyer's background, this is going to be a fabulous discussion with our guest, James Alexander. But before we bring our guest on, we're going to set the platform. And many of you might have seen this video many times, it's been done many times before, but this video actually has been redone in Italian. And it's more recently redone in Italy. And they did this video that was done here in the 1940s. And it's called the Dow, the Dow Project. So I would like to show this really quick video just to set the stage for people to see a little bit about what we're going to talk about and what internal racism might be. Can we show the video, please? Quale bambola è bianca? Quale bambola è nera? Quale delle due è bella? Mm, questa. 
Qual è quella bella? Qual è quella brutta? E qual è quella buona? Quale è cattiva? Qual è buona? Perché è buona? Perché hai gli occhi celesti. Quale è cattiva? Perché è cattiva? Perché è tutto, tutto nero. E qual è la bambola che ti somiglia di più? Quale bambola è nera? Mi ha offeso. Chi? Tu. Perché? Perché mi hai chiamato nero. Perché ti offendi? Mi offendi perché altri bambini mi hanno offeso con cattiveria. No, io non ho usato nessuna cattiveria. Quello sto mi sta guardando storto. So we wanted to give you, we want to show that because a lot of people that I've talked to in this era have not, they've never heard about the dial test. And very interesting, it was done in the 1940s and this was redone and recreated in Italy. And as you see, there was very little difference from back in the 1940s, what black children thought about themselves and how they felt the black, even though they look like the black doll, the black doll is bad. So what does that really mean to us? So we have here with us today an unbelievable guest who has done lots of studies on this type of research. We have today with us Mr. James Alexander. He has over 30 years of professional experience as an organized and as an organization development consultant and executive coach in both the private and public sector. In this capacity, he has helped individuals and teams and organizations realize their dreams and their missions for, successful, for, for successfully addressing the challenges and issues facing today's workforce, which is something that plays out with internal racism as social equity, intercultural competence and change management. He has a bachelor's of arts in social research and a master's in social and human systems, both from Antioch University. He's a longtime resident of Montgomery County and he volunteers on numerous, numerous organizations and is a member of, you know, supporting the community, a member of many organizations. And so I won't tell Goldbeck anymore. I want Mr. Alexander to tell us a little bit about himself and then tell us more about what we just saw And then really, what is internal racism? Thank you so much, Dr. Butler. Greetings, everyone. It's an honor to be on a panel with you, Dr. Dwyer, such really renowned heavyweights intellectually and also a social activist. So I really appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation with you about this subject. And just to go back a little bit into my background, when I... The work that I do as an organization development consultant and also as an executive coach, it's to help people be more effective, to reach their goals, to work together as teams. So sometimes that's resolving conflicts. Sometimes that's helping people with their strategic planning or their personal planning. But the most important thing is to be able to actually uh, 
to actually actualize their goals, to be able to achieve their goals, not just to plan it, but actually achieve their goals. I was thinking, as I was saying, I was thinking about the work of Paula Friera when he talked about pedagogy of the press and he talked about reflection and action. And as we look at internalized racism, I think um, that's going to be a theme that comes up quite a bit because we want to have knowledge about this particular topic, but we also want to be able to take action on this. So getting back to internalized racism, the way I define it, and this is James Alexander, where I'm coming from, is I see it as a tool of oppression. And it focuses on the socialization process. And what it does is it manipulates or influences Black people to accept, to believe, uh, to internalize the and act on the racist negative images that we receive from our society, from our culture. And it's not really beneficial for us to do that. So by bringing this more to the fore in this particular conversation, I hope this is beginning of a, you know, a longer process to focus on this area. So as I was watching the video, I was thinking about another test that was done. Who was it, the brown eyes, blue eyes? Are yeah. you familiar yeah. with that? Okay. Yes. And that yeah. also kind of illuminated the differences that people have as far as um, racism and the internal aspect of it. So I just wanted to say those few things. I'll turn it back to you, Yvette. You know, I want to jump in here real quick because some of the things that people miss on is the epidemiology of how things are passed on, right? So we we know that studies that if the parent or the mother, more often the mother, can pass on genetic coding on emotions, right? So if you have this internal emotion that you are receiving or feeling, you can pass that genetic code over to your children and they will feel the trauma or the displacement of how the mother felt. This is very important that a lot of black culture did not understand. So we've been passing on what you call genetic displacement or genetic dislike for themselves because of dot, dot, dot internal racism, trauma afflicted to themselves. So this has a lot to do how things have been passed on culturally. Now they have a name for that now. Um, and I can't remember the name. I was watching, I was watching one of the, sh one of the shows, um, one of the new shows that are out and the young black lady and, and I, I forgot the actress name, but they actually have a name for that now. What is the name for passing on genetically these type of and these, you know, innate now, these social, these social deprivation and social, I should say, just oppression that we've gone through, genetically passing that on to your children to accept it. There's a name for that. Do you, does anyone here know the name for that? Because I, epigenics or epigenics or? It's epigenics. Epigenics, That's, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Going, going along with that, I think, um, just to follow up with what Dr. Dyer just said, it's important to realize that it is passed from gener. It is an intergenerational issue that we're looking at, and it's also in you know in the past we kind of looked at it as just in the mind or the way we think, but it's in the body. And you know, actually, human beings are holistic. You know, so they're not just one. You know, once the mind, the body, um, the spirit, it all comes together, and so the generations of, of racial oppression that we've had um, from the slavery, you know, the, the crossing over this country, that is all part of, as Puck pounded out, that's all part of our DNA. And the other thing about it is we haven't had an opportunity over the years to really take a look at how that's impacted us as far as us moving for a, um, actually an architecture of liberation that's going to take us to the next level. That's correct. And, and I think the reason why it has not been looked at, because it hasn't been taught. And I think so many families, so many families, try, they don't, they're like, well, I'm just going to move past it. I'm just going to move over it. But we never move through it. And I think until we teach our community how to move through it and just understand it, I think that's what I love doing the most is just educating people about what it is that you're not understanding. Not, I'm not saying you got to 
muddle through it. You've always got to bring it up. But understanding how it is an effect, because there is an effect. And until you understand the cause and effect on your cell structure, you're just going to always keep reliving it internally. And that's what's being passed on. It's the internal that keeps delivering. Because social systems, they keep placating that this is like the, like the children, right? Without us raising them any sort of way, the social normality says white is better than black. It's, that's just a social norm. It, it's, it's played out in the theater of these social norms, and that's what you call systematic racism. Now, you know, I'm glad we're having this conversation today because we don't talk about this enough as Black people. No, no. And this affects we're afraid of it. How, yeah, we're afraid of it, but it affects us daily and our mm -hmm. daily activities, our daily lives. And you know, how we in, interact with each other and other folks from other races. So how do we identify and how can you tell when we're a victim of internal racism? I mean, I, I, I think I'm, I know I have it big time and, but I've been able to recognize some of the things and change only because of my experiences out of this country. So how do we, and this is for both. Dr. Dyer, because you have a lot of history, especially on the neuropsychology part of it, as far as some of this. I mean, how, how do we identify it? And this goes, I know you're the co-host, but I want you to answer this too, Dr. Dyer, for us. And James, please, Mr. Alexander, I want you to ask, you know, we're person and victims of internal racism. How do we tell and how do we kind of start trying to move through it instead of around it? Not a, it's not an easy conversation to have, first of all, because there's a lot of feelings that come up. I think about the term like emotional intelligence. Um, and first of all, job one is you have to have self-awareness, self-awareness of what's going on, and then being able to successfully manage your emotion so you can move to the next step. One of the uh, authors that I know that have dealt with um, this issue a lot talks about how important it is to really have self-compassion for yourself and for others that are, you know, that have been dealing with this for so long. And so um, when we're talking about dealing with internalized racism um, with our family, with friends, our loved ones, um, we want to make sure that we don't try to hit them with a blunt object on this because, you know, there's so many feelings around that sometimes that just brings up more fear, um, more guilt, more, more shame. So it's important for each and every one of us to take the time ourselves and do the work on ourselves to be aware of it and be, be also be aware that we are constantly inundated by these negative messages in the media, in organization, organizations and institutions and whatnot. And the reason why so many of these institutions and organizations do that because they're supposed to be providing services to us and they're so busy, yes. yeah. okay, blaming the victim, yeah. okay? You know, it's yeah. like take for instance uh, in the education system and whatnot. Well, there's, you know, there's this um, gap, you know, achievement gap. Well, it's not really achievement gap. The fact <laughs> is that they're not doing the job to educate and, and reach out to our kids. So that's yes. why I call internal, internalized racism a socialization process, okay? It's a socialization process that doesn't take us in a, a forward in a way that we need in order, as I said, to look at the, the liberation architecture. James said it right. You know, when we talk about self-awareness, you know, I'm getting ready to teach a class tomorrow with a good friend of mine, Lynn Twyman, and we're going to be going over those emotional triggers, those things. And ultimately, we have to start with self-awareness. These Self-awareness is never taught anywhere unless you come to someone specifically like myself or James, anyone. You, you have to literally look out for people who are going to teach you self-awareness skills, right? Before you can get to emotional intelligence, like James says, you first must understand who is thyself? What am I? 
where do I come from? Not where was I born, but who am I? What type of being am I? I'm a, I'm a life force in itself. And that self-awareness, you have to ask yourself, who teaches that? Not in this westernized society cu culture, does not teach specifically the black man, uh, African American man, self awareness because they want you to move away from who you are as a self. So they give you your defined information, they give you the, the, the defined ideology of what you're supposed to be like, what you need to be like for them. They're still producing a working slave. For them, and until it, if once you realize that you are a self-lighted being of this earth, that takes them away from their working animal that they're trying to keep producing. This is why the media does what it does and highlights. If you you know it immediately, immediately, if you do it with there's a shooting, you know it's a white person because they don't show his face at all. That's immediate. You, you you can sit back like there's a shooting. Is it a white man or a black man? It's a white guy because they don't they don't show his face at all. But if it's a white person, they they they're somehow you you have to what does this person look like? You're questioning it. Do they have the picture of the person? But if it's a black person, they have his junior high school picture. They can get any picture, they'll put his baby picture up there going, This is what he looks like. So yes. Yes. it's well, you know, so, yeah, just to follow up on with that, there's so many images like that. I remember for Katrina when they had the images of black people looting yeah, and yeah. white people finding oh, yeah. stuff. It was the same thing, okay? But again, it was that, that message. Get, and getting back to the emotional aspect of it that's really so important for us as black people is we need to develop a, a better understanding of, of what I call emotional literacy. That is mm -hmm. how these messages affect us emotionally and what are some of the things that we can do um, about that. I mentioned already uh, compassion. That's really important. Um, and understanding that um, the challenges that people, that black people face, along with that, I think it's really important, is be able to understand and communicate with empathy you know, for our, ourselves and our others. If you're not able to do that, you're really not going to be able to make those connections. What do you guys think? Well, you, I you know, to, when it I, comes... I, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Well, I, I just want to say one thing as far as when it comes to... I want to put it that self-realization and knowing thyself because no one teaches you that. As Dr. you were saying, no one teaches you that. And... How do, you know, really, because I want to know, how do we get there to start teaching, especially our young individuals? Because I look at myself as, you know, you know we're, we're, we're kind of fixated and we, we don't, we're not willing to learn more as older folks. And we should, we should always be learning and always be growing. And I have to be honest, when I, I did not understand what internal racism was personally until I left this country. And mm. I left this country and went and lived in a black country. I lived in Antigua, West Indies for 18 months. And living in Antigua, West Indies, I have to say, I didn't even realize it then until I came back to the United States. And that's mm. when I understood what internal racism was. But I, I learned self while I was there and came back with a different thrust for life as a black woman in America. And I would say a black woman in America, even though I was born here, I know I'm not from here and my ancestral roots is not from here. And I know my historical background, but it took me leaving the country to understand that. How do we get to the self-realization and the self-understanding and the teaching so we can move through it and not around it? Okay, so it, this is so quick because we I was just talking about this today is writing it. There's, there's two ways. Either we build our own schools and we teach and we teach we teach our own people right right we build either we build our own schools or we ask the counties to build our own schools because right now we know our kids are not feeling safe in these schools period yes. right they're not being taught period they're being ignored period this year alone, it's going to be 12 million black and brown boys who are not going to be able to read above a ninth grade level that's turning 18 and leaving high school. That's in this country. That's that's 12 million, right? So that's easy. So the, so the next thing is, so 
how do we teach our kids? We talk about mentoring shit. We talk about education. But here's the problem I think black America has. They don't want to pay for it. Like, they just want something to be given to them, and yet we know that they need it. But what about the educator? What about the facility? They will not go to the facility and say, well, my kid don't need that, but they'll pay, they'll pay for an iPhone for the child. They'll pay a video yeah. game for the child. But they won't pay for an education for self-realization for the child. I'm, I'm always pissed off and hurt by it because you see these people spend more money on materialistic than self-education. That kind of disturbs me. So a lot has to do with, you know, you got to think more about longevity and living than just surviving in material things. So that's just my take on it. Yeah, I would add to that um, the fact that both of you are on the panel and, and what you're talking about is something that, that I admire and respect because what we need is more positive role models for young people coming up. We have sometimes over the years, I think we all know we have people who, you know, talk the talk but didn't walk the walk. And both of you are doing that, have been doing that. And that is really important. You know, it's not just, you know, you know the old saying, it's not just what you say, but it's what you do. And when young people see that and they have that influence, that's really important. And the other thing positive about what you, you're doing, what you were talking about at the beginning about the work that you're doing, and that is, you know, is build organizations that really represent what our needs are. Okay, that aren't in, you know, um, full of a lot of, of the internalized racism from the messages that, that come out. And we really need to. Um, as we're aware of that, we need to reframe and challenge these messages that, you know, that influence our kids. Because when, you know, when they're influenced as young people by these messages um, mm -hmm. that say negative things about them, by the time they're adults, they're acting on that. And they're not yes. even aware of that. And the challenge, and the other challenge you, you, you guys kind of admitted is there's a lot of distractions out there. A lot of, you know, like sports and music and whatnot. So those are neater things, you know, for young people to talk about and spend their energy to. I mean, I'm much older, but I remember when I was coming up, um, you know, there was like the last poets. There was uh, Bob Marley, um, yeah. Gil Scott, you know, talking about the, you know, the liberation of people using their, their craft, their skill to get people to start thinking about those things. And I don't see those kinds of messages. I'm, I'm sure there's someone doing some that are doing that, but they're not being widely disseminated. You see what's being widely disseminated right now. And a lot of black people, unfortunately, you know, what they see, you know, whatever is think that, oh, wow, we're being so creative and whatnot. The reason why they're being disseminated there is because they know that that helps continue to enslave us and enslave our mind. So again, that's just something I wanted to add to the equation. When you I mean, say that last year, year, oh, no, go ahead. It, it, it's, it has a lot to do with where do black people, African Americans, where do they get their media? Where do they get their news source? Who are they watching? You know, Africa Today, this is a great model, you know, African owned, it's just beautiful. But does this go across like CNN? Does it get the global perspective or or does it get pushed on all these other networks? And that and so there's still gatekeepers out there. There's still people holding back what is what who we are. Right. So we we try. We have our own networks. We have our own social um, social medias. But I look at young black kids. They're not on black social medias. They're on the other social medias. So right. we're not reaching them be like we would like to because we would want to. But then when I when you reach out and talk to them, and this is the other thing us elders must do, must do. And that's a strong statement. We have to start talking to our children, our young people on a common, compassionate basis. How are you doing, young sister, young brother? Peace and love to you, young king, young queen. How can I help you? Let them look at you all strange and weird, like, what are you talking about, old man? And I'll be like, okay, you have a blessed and peaceful day. Let them know that we see them because I don't think they trust us because we have not reached enough of them to say we care for them. 
So I think that has a lot to do with that. Not that they are mistrusting, but we have not reached enough of them to say these people care enough for us. Not just our mothers, uncles, friends, family, whatever. We're just talking about elders in the community to the to to the lower force. That's all. No, I, I definitely agree with that. I, I believe this. That's that statement. It takes a village um, to raise yeah. a child, and we we really need to to realize and appreciate that because sometimes, um, to be honest, we get focused on the things that we're doing. And, and not really taking the time to look at the most important thing. And again, that's our youth that are flowering, that they need to have our support and our understanding to build, and we need to build those relationships. So again, going back to what I said, be able to, to listen and understand with empathy and not necessarily judge them because you know they're you know they're listening to music that maybe we're not familiar with, or they're dressing or interacting in a way that that we're not doing. There's still the opportunity for us to form a bridge with them and realize that there is solidarity, and we can again. I keep going back to that to that architecture of liberation. Mm -hmm. James, you know one of the things that I've noticed when with this music that they're listening to that uh, that's unhealthy. And it has a lot to do with not just the words, because the words are powerful, they have an effect, but it's also the rhythm timing. It's it's the beats that they use. It is what you yeah. call, the, the frequencies they're using are, are what you call unhealthy frequencies. That's a whole other science level. They're using those frequencies to bring you down into what you call an unconscious level. Here's a huge mm -hmm. difference. Frequencies are light. Light is energy. Sound is a wave. And it can bring your body down to a lower level where your cells are not vibrating at a higher frequency, which makes you sick, which brings your what you call your, your, your chemistry starts to produce what you call less dopamine. Right. So it produces a cortisol in that cortisol kills brain cells. In the killing of the brain cells, your prefrontal cortex does not get fully developed. Because it does not get fully developed, now we're talking about cognitive thinking. We're talking about rationalized thinking. We're talking about creative thinking. We're talking about... These are so many things. So it keeps pulling you into this fear, flight, freeze mode, which is the back of the old part of the brain. So it, it, so it decreases brain activity. And we know that children don't fully develop, men, black or boys, don't fully develop until age of 25, 26. So if yeah. they're in this trauma state, in this frequency state, they're not fully developing at all. So now their reasoning development is off. So now you're talking about how come these children are not what reading well, that wasn't taught well, and then the cognitive development isn't there. So look at what they're producing. What look at what they're forcing our kids to be. Yeah, when you, when you mention that, it's important to look at the larger picture too. The larger picture is this makes black people, um, black children as they grow up, it makes them mental, emotional slaves. So they're yes. participating, they're contributing to the system and, and, you know, giving their resources to the system instead of moving forward. Kind of rem reminds me of like the Matrix, you know, when they in that movie, when they pointed out, you know, that people were all in, in this illusion and whatnot. And actually their energy and their resources were being siphoned off of them and they weren't even aware of it. And another part, I think, of that movie that was really interesting is you had one of the, the people who decided to become a, a, a traitor and whatnot because he said, hey, I'd rather live in this world of illusion, okay, than, than go through the hassle, the fighting, um, just to, you know, be in the real world of reality. And I think, that, and in fact, I know that's what happens to so many people. Rather than, you know, take up, you know, take up mental arms to, um, to, uh, develop themselves emotionally, uh, mentally, and spiritually. They rather just be distracted by this, the music, uh, the social um, system that you know encourages that, as a, as opposed to moving forward. Well, we're going to take a real quick commercial break, but we're going to come back, and we really need to talk about some solutions. Um, what are some solutions to internalized racism, and really where? do we go from here 
and give our audience steps on what they can do to really be actively engaged and involved in reducing internal racism. We can't say get rid of it yet, but we want to get rid of it and eventually will, but at least starting to identify it, addressing it, and getting rid of it. So let's take a real quick, real quick commercial break and we'll be right back. Thank you guys so much. I know we had a commercial break. I know we're all still here. You know, if, you know what? <laughs> it, it, <laughs> I don't think the commercials happen just yet. <laughs> well, if we don't you know the commercial is not going to happen just yet. Hey, we can just continue on because we only have an hour and there's a lot more to talk about and to say. Um, I think James thought we we're going to do a commercial break, but let's, you know, let's let, let's 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 see let's see if get him back. But I really want to, Dr. Dyer. I mean, what for our audience? What can we do? I mean, what can we do right now? And where do we? We, what do we start? I, I think the, 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 we, we talked about self-awareness, right? We talked about getting to the teacher. We, we, we really have to take, besides taking ownership and all that, we have to step back and say, ask yourself the question, who am I and where do and where can I be? Because where you are right now, that can change. And it yeah. does change. But we, that because once you accept that I don't know who I am or I would like to be, don't start asking those questions what you'd like to be. First, own, own thyself and say, you just don't know who you are, right? And, and, and as a young person or even as a person that's never been taught that, that's literally asking someone, how do I learn a, 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 a algebra? If you've never been taught algebra, you cannot make it up. You cannot just look at the equations and go, I think I know what that means. You have to get taught. I cannot stress this enough that we are not being sought out enough or being allowed to have this mentor program where kids are coming. They'll go to a basketball game. They'll go to a football game. They'll go to any of these other sports. And these parents will say, well, you know, you need to get outside. But they won't say Let's get you taught self-actualization. That's what we need. Because until they're there in front of us, they will still remain in that darkness, in that form or void that James was talking about serving the system. I, I, there's no way around it. I mean, we can give you tools all day long, but there's no way for you to start practicing the tool tools until you start being taught how to use the tool. I can't give you a shovel and, and say, well, you put your foot on it and I describe it for you. You're going to get a shovel and you're not going to be able to dig a ditch. That's, that's, that's where I'm at right now. It is tough to describe just general things to do. This isn't cooking salt, pepper, and mix it up. This is something that has to be taught where you understand what I mean and you and the person looks at you, right, James, and goes, I don't know. You go, okay, so let me reframe this, right? Let me let me do this again because that's the part of the education that's going to get missed because if I just give you ideas, you're going to be like, I, I, I'm not sure if I understand that. I don't know what Dr. Paul was talking about. And, that, and, and then they're, and they're still lost. So following up on what you just pointed out, um, I think it's really important um, to think about how we do interact with young people and how we interact with people in, in general. general. Um, if we just kind of stay in our own generation thing and we don't understand where they're coming from and how to connect with them, we can't use, um, again, use going from an Asian term, we can't use what's called expedient means, okay? Mm. That is to be able to, to reach them where they're at and carefully move them forward to the next level, okay? If we're just saying, I mean, if I'm talking to young people, I'm not going to say anything about the last poets or or because I know they can't relate to that. That's not part of their experience. But taking time to find out what is important to them and, and how, you know, again, that can relate to them moving forward in a more positive way. I think that's something that's really important. So 
giving them an opportunity to really have that self-reflection, okay, and, 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 and be with someone who can, can show them that, you know, this is what's going on and this is some of the reasons why you're in this particular situation or you're experiencing this thing, then you can kind of help them move them forward. But you have to, again, you have to be able to reach them. You have to be able, for lack of a better word, to have those crucial conversations up front. And, you know, wh now where can people go to really start some of this dialogue? Because I know that okay. here in the county, we don't have a lot of options. And I know with our organization, Gap Buster, and I'll, and I'll just say this, we've been doing this for years and have been able to service lots of individuals. But during this period, in the, in the, especially in the pandemic, everything's been cut off. We've been... It, it, we, we, we've truly been segregated from one another, but I know with all the technology, we can all come together, even in the virtual world like we are today now. How do we reach out and start having these, I, I call them courageous conversations, and really start changing some of, the, some of our well, young I know people? There's a, I know there's a, a psychologist um, who, um, Actually, I saw on a, uh, a local TED talk, and uh, her name is Dr. Cheryl Grills, and she has what's called emotional emancipation circles, and they are, are designed to give people an opportunity, black people, an opportunity to talk about some of these some of these issues around internalized racism, so that we can support each other in understanding what's been happening to us, and again, being able not only to understand how it impacts us, but be able to make a decision that no, we don't have to continue to identify with that, that we can move forward in another more positive direction. So, but, but those, James, so again, those are some steps that are really important to happen. Yes. One of the things you said, she, she's having circles, and I know who you're talking about, but people have to show up. <laughs> <That's> yes. <laughs> the, there, we're running into the same problem again. You have gap busters. They got to show up. You can say, yeah. come to gap busters. I'll bring in James. I'll bring in Dr. Paul. I'll bring in any horse that you need me to, to, to get here. But you have to be here. They have to be here. We yes. can have yeah. mentor programs every day of the week. And if they're not showing up or parents are not pushing their young child to us, now other cultures, and I'm not going to name the cultures, other cultures be like, you're going to this building to learn this because that's yes. part of yes. our culture, period. <laughs> There's not an if and buts in the world. You can be mad at me all you want, but you're going to go to this building and you're yep. going to learn your culture, period. We don't have that. So we could say every Saturday we're at this gymnasium. The only people that more often would be there would be the few kids and the, and the same adults. We have it all the time. We have Saturday schools. We have African schools. We have all these different things. And yet there's still the same kids coming and the same kids not coming. And then we, we, we like, how come we can't get to this? So we go to the schools. We hand out flyers. We would like for you to come talk to your African-American kids. We give it to the parents. And the parents do just like this and throw it away. So now, so <laughs> what's our problem? We're, yeah. we're, we're, you're asking for solutions. And where's that problem? I, I don't know. If you could. You, yeah, part, part of the problem is, is the work that's being done, the inner work that needs to be done. Okay. With, you know, not only, you know, with the children, of course, with the parents and with our, in ourselves, okay, yeah. so that, you know, we can get it, you know, in building the kind of alliances to find out the kinds of things um, that are important to young people and bring them in. It's not easy. There's no two ways about it. But when you have those small wins from the low uh, hanging fruit, you know, continuing to build on that. Um, one Again, one of the challenges that we talked about is, a lot of times we don't have access to media to disseminate the success, oh, the good me. things that we've done. Um, and so people don't get a chance to hear it because, again, um, the larger media is concerned. They're too busy, again, blaming us for the mess that they made. Um, and it actually, it's not a mess. What they, they want us to do is they want us to stay uninformed. They want us to continue to have a slave mentality. 
Okay, so the more that we can reach out to others and, you know, and break away from that, it's going to be to our advantage. But, you know, it takes time, you know, and again, we, you know, being able to to have success and then disseminate it. And, you know, and so that what does that mean? That means, again, that we're going to have to have a, a, a greater effort to getting in control of the social media um, and, and the regular media that gets in touch with us, uh, that, that, that influences our community. Well, you know, I just wanted to say one thing about, because we're so disjointed, like we are yeah. all in Montgomery County, Maryland, and Montgomery County, Maryland is so disjointed in itself, as far as what I say, black folks. And I think and that's what, you know, American Africans unite, it's all about uniting us. And it bothers me on a daily basis here, especially how in this one little area, and it's nationwide and worldwide, we are allowing people to separate us based on where we come from and who we are. And we're all black folks, all Africans. Right. But yet we can't even come together as united folks. And then they and then they bring that other mix in of, oh, well, you know, because right here in the county, we have an African, African-American, Caribbean <laughs> advisor groups to the county executive. We have three black groups working on behalf of a county. But yet we have one Latina, one Asian, one Muslim. Mm -hmm. And actually they're part of another group. And but we can't we're it's not we're not in a big a large part of this community, but yet we're so divided and we focus and continually you know, just allow the division. And we ourselves, I look at ourselves as being not, we victimize our own selves doing this and disenfranchise our own selves and people from moving but that's forward. The, that's the, well, I'm familiar with that, but I'll oh, go ahead. Go ahead. But no, I was just going to say, but that's the internalized racism. Yes. I mean, that, that, that is the, the, the point of the topic of the conversation. That is the internalized racism that affects more often black people, Africans, than any other culture ever. So it, you, you, you're, we're explaining the problem. We're explaining how there is a solution in all this conversation. And I hope people recognize the solution. It means for you to show up and make the phone call. That's it. Because if you don't know who to call, if you're watching the show, you know who to call now, right? If you, so that that cuts that out, and, and and we can get you in front of people, right? You just got to make the phone call, and that's where the internalized. You want to stop internalized racism? Make the phone call. Yes. So, um, being specific, what you're talking about, uh, just so happens I have some familiarity with that. I kind of smile. <laughs> about that because we've had some discussions about this uh, so, I know we go way back talking about when we're it looking it's at when we're looking at internalized racism we have to remember that our brothers and sisters from the Caribbean um, from Africa and whatever they're getting the same kind of uh, racist messages negative messages about us and that's how I they see us through the media um, yes. you know, through social media and whatnot. And so they're looking at us, you know, with, with a lot of skepticism, you know, with, a, you know, th that's really the, you know, the, the, um, the outcome of the, of the reason um, that, that those messages, that they've taken in those messages. So what we're, what we're seeing is nothing to be surprised about because um, that's what those messages were designed to do to divide and conquer, to keep us separated. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't come together. It, I would be surprised to see us come together as black people throughout the, the diaspora, through the Caribbean, African, African-American, under an organization like the county government, because the county <laughs> government is not there. That's not their top goal, to bring us together, to make us more oh, effective, yes. OK? Our responsibility, to the way I see it, our responsibility is to find what are the, the common ground, what is the areas that we can work together on so we can see and know each other, know each other's background, um, form relationships, okay, that we can depend on and we know about and actually 
that foundation is there. We just haven't utilized that through those three organizations. That's it's there. Okay. But but coming together under the county government and expect oh, I, for I them to support us to be government. empowered, <laughs> that makes absolutely <laughs> no sense at all. So let me let me be know, clear about that. But I'm, yeah, I'm I'm going off. So go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, no I you say, I, I look at what and I and I go back and say what Kwame Kuma said when he became the president and the first prime minister of of Ghana, of an independent Ghana. And because they were all colonialized and so on, we were and we were instituted and we were and we had slavery, but what he said. And this is so pointed to today. A solution to a black man's problem and to an African's problem will only be solved by an African or a black man. So we have to solve our problems. We know what the issues are. And so we have to solve them. We can't look for anyone else who doesn't look like us to do so. But we have to be willing to take that plunge and work together and solve our issues and so i feel so i'm so torn because so many of us are so complacent in this system so, so, of allowing us and being divided and allowing that so how about this, this yes i i have an answer for you because we're um there's a group called the the caucus of african american leaders of maryland have put together a forum that's happening in july July 8th and 9th at Morgan State that is calling for all black Americans in Maryland to show up to build a policy that's good for us for the whole state of Maryland from the eastern shore to the western shore. So there it is. We're having a forum like it was back nice. in Indiana, right? In Gary, Indiana, when he had that forum, the black forum. We're having that forum here at Morgan State University on July 8th and 9th. Ask and it's uh, you don't have come bring your voice bring your passion and we build a policy that's going to be good for all Black America or, or all Black people in Maryland. So we have so now let's see who shows up because it's it's there now we just got to keep herding him in. You know sometimes it's like herding cats, but we got to keep and this is not going to be the only one that's ever going to happen. But this is going to be the first one that's going to happen. And that's great. And so and and I'm not familiar with the organization, but I think it's a great opportunity to start building momentum of us working together. So it sounds very, very commendable. So I think we yeah, need to so make I, sure I, we I, get that out publicly and get that information out. And, and that's something we can they have a flyer we can start posting on our show and send it out on our on our networks. Because we have to let people know this is my first time knowing this is great. Because we have to start. We, 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 everyone, I think all of us here have worked in our, in our various different areas trying to do some of this, but I think we all should start think working more collectively and really putting all of our ducats out there and pulling us all together because we have to solve our own problems and we have to change and start something now. And everyone says it was with politics and it is also with politics because right now we have <laughs> so many African black folks running for office and people don't even no. know. No. And that is so, I mean, that's, that's, a, I mean, it doesn't surprise me, but it disappoints me because there's so many people out here who are running across the country and people don't even Very often know. against the, each other. Well, not against, yeah. well, you know, they love when we run against each other. But I always tell people, there's enough of us, we can run a slate. What white people can do, other people can do it, we can do it. And we need to understand that point. We're so af afraid of running together when it's like, oh, I can't be seen with another black person because if I'm seen with another black person, I'm running a slate. We should start running slates just like they do. There's enough of us in this country, you know, especially in this state, to push the envelope where we can win all together. And that's the problem that we have as black folks. We're so afraid to work together, even in the politics. We say, oh yeah, we work together. We're, af we're afraid to run a slate when there's positions available for all of them to take. We're afraid to work together and make it work for all of us. And we can do it. 
If they can do it, we can do it. Let's think about it. I, I, um, I agree with you, um, but going back to originally what we started talking about is internalized racism. Yes. I see the fact that we're not doing that is, is, uh, is really just a symptom of that. And, you know, when you, when you look at, at what needs to be done as far as internalized racism is concerned, it, it involves, you know, being courageous and being willing to take the time to really look at your own experiences and, and be vulnerable is, and have humility um, about, you know, what's happened to you, um, the mistakes that you've made and how you can move forward. Um, and being able to, to actually share that. So it's not, a, you know, a sexy topic or a conversation that a lot of people have. But, you know, the reason why I mentioned uh, that other or organization uh, that, that's having those emancipation circles is that we really need to start small so people, you know, understand um, that they can have an opportunity to, to work with others that are and that have been negatively influenced by these messages as well. So it's you know it's not just you know over here over there. It's all over. It's um, it's very encompassing. Um, and so creating a safe place and that that's not always there. Um, and that's one of the things I think um, Yvette, why we don't have you know as as much uh, collective. Uh, action together. We need to create that safe space. And the only way we can do that is people take the time to really work on their feelings um, and understand how they've been impacted by, by this. Um, a Dr. Kara Banks uh, came up with a really important point in looking at internalized racism. She pointed out that it's something that you have to continuously look at. It's not something, okay, well, I'm aware of it now and that's it. Because right. the messages continue, they continue to hit us in so many different ways. And unless, you know, we're yes. in constant dialogue, constant awareness about this, we're going to uh, make mistakes. We're going to, to alienate folks that really um, in our community should be our allies. And that, that is so true. And, and I think, Every, the way we live every day and, it, and internal racism is also currently we see it is it's rolling out in every walk of life for black folks here and for other folks who actually are not in the majority as they say but I want to, you know, this is, a, we, have, we have a great conversation. I think we should have more of these conversations and James, I want to thank you for bringing this to my attention. Cause I'll tell you honestly, Dr. Dahi brought this to my attention. I said, you know, this is something we really have to start talking about because we don't talk about it. And we need to start having more dialogues publicly out like this and being able to push them out to the community so they can even look at later on because we have to start having these conversations. If we plan on staying here, and if we plan on moving forward as black folks, as Africans, we are going to have to make some changes, but I don't want to end up right now. When I want, I want each of you to, I want you to give me some. Dr. Dyer, we'll start with you, then we'll end it with James. Tell us some last bits of, you know, actions to eliminate internal racism. Because so I know you mentioned some already, but can you tell the audience just again where are some actions that we can take? And again, remind us of the date of the meeting, and we're going to get hopefully have a flyer put up pretty soon. But please, can you um, can you say a few last words before we wrap up? Because it's almost at that hour. So I do want to respect everyone's time. But Dr. Dyer, I I want to I really want to stay on self awareness. I think that self awareness is key, and it's understanding what you don't understand. It's not understanding what you do understand. Understanding the things you're you're you feel uncomfortable with. That's internal racism, something that makes your, your mouth dry, that's something that causes a twitch, something that you, it creates apprehension. Because when you're living in what you call a free state of consciousness, there is no apprehension. If you feel uncomfortable going into that room, sitting in that chair, driving that car, stopping in that, those are all signals of internal racism. So it's self-awareness and then self-actualization. So that way, keep it really simple. Thank you so much. And I want to give our last words to our guests. Um, 
Mr. Alexander, thank you so much, Ken. And can you give us some last words? Well, um, actually what's been said is really, really important. Um, I would say from, from my experience, sometimes, as I said, we get kind of pigeonholed in what, we do, what we're doing. So being aware of how we can connect with, with other people in our community. I mean, I, I think that, you know, I've had, I, I remember you talk, talked, uh, Yvette, about going to, you know, to another country and that kind of opens your eyes. Um, just coming from New York to down to this area, I realized, you know, that there was a big difference, you know, in my experience. And so I realized that I had to bridge the gap. As a young person, I remember, you know, calling back to my family and saying, hey, these people out here, they really talk funny. They dress funny and whatnot. And so there's always that going on. So it's important for us to be able to continuously do the work within ourselves to have that reflection, to have that understanding and be able to be vulnerable about that. Also, perhaps in some other conversations that we have, I hope that, um, that you know, we, we can have some conversations about some of the challenges that we faced because of internalized racism and how we were able to overcome those challenges and understand the mental blocks that were put up, up up in front of us. And that's not an easy conversation uh, to have, to, you know, to admit that, you know, that you, you know, had problems, that you made mistakes or whatever. But I think that's an important aspect of what we need to get out. We need to create that safe space. That's really important. And to make those connections. So that's what I, I that's the things I like to end with. Thank you. Well, I, well, I want to thank you so much for being our guest today. And Dr. Dyer, I am definitely excited for you being here today because, you know, I, as a, your background, you've been doing this for years and looking at not only internal racism, but just different things for neurological psych, psych things for black folks. So we are definitely, I, I don't want you to be part of this forever with me if possible, but I want to thank Africa today. And remember, we're going to, this show is on every other Friday now, and we are going to have our next guest will be the county executive of Montgomery County. And so we are hoping to have call in so people can call in, ask questions, because we need to find out what has been going on in Montgomery County, how effective has it been, and, you know, give us a little record of what you've done for Black folks and Africans in Montgomery County. So I want to thank Africa today. I want to thank my guests. I want to thank my co-hosts. And I want to thank Amerit being, being here to be the voice of AAU. And I want to thank all of my watchers out there tonight. And please share this because this is going to be recorded. You can go to YouTube and you'll have this video up and while well, videos will be up within hopefully the next 24 hours so you can share it out. And please join us first weekend of June, because next weekend, I'm so excited. My last child is finally graduating from Cornell, going on to Wall Street. So I'm really excited. And we're going to be out in upstate New York. So I am excited about, I'll be missing you, but I'm excited to be able to get, to have an empty nest. So I am your host, Dr. Yvette butler Bowl, with my co-host, Dr. Paul Dyer, I want you to say your name out there, Dr. Paul Dyer. <laughs> and we're excited to have you today. And thank you, Africa Today, for allowing us this time. So thank you for Hey, what's your email? What's your